All right, there we go. All right, there we go. Uh, I am so angry about this story. I read it in I read it in a in the car when I was waiting for Mitzi outside of her circus class, and I was growing furiouser and furiouser. And that was before I did all my background research, which only made me furious, furiouser. Why did it make you furiouser? Well, you okay? Well, right up top. Okay, so we're not. This isn't even the body. Should we just start the show? Yeah. I'm Phil. And I'm Willow. And it's, it's Del, Del Toro, Toro time. time. It's Del Toro time. It's Del Toro time. On the night after the day she had stained the louvered window shutters of her new apartment on East 52nd Street, Beth saw a woman slowly and hideously knifed to death in the courtyard of her building. She was one of twenty-six witnesses to the ghoulish scene, and like them she did nothing to stop it. You just heard the opening paragraph of The Whimper of Whipped Dogs by Harlan Ellison, and who is our reader? I don't know. <laughs> It was me. It's me. It's okay. Me. I, I just did the reading. It's a really quick paragraph. I just did, I just read it myself. Uh, the whimper of whipped dogs. Uh, off mic, before we even started recording, you were just like, why did you make me read this? Why did you make me read this? It's literally in The Dark Descent. We could have skipped it. <laughs> it's literally in The Dark Descent by David G. Hartwell, uh, which is and it's our next story because we're covering The Dark Descent by David G. Hartwell. But um, why did you why were you angry at having read it? Because it's bad. It's bad news. It's bad, bad, bad. It's it's bad business. It's bad for people. It's bad. What What is bad about it? It's Harlan Ellison, one of the most famous speculative fiction authors in the history of speculative fiction. Uh, what What is bad about it? Everything. Did you ever read I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream? No. Oh, <laughs> it's one of Harlan Ellison's most famous short stories. Harlan Ellison wrote over a thousand short stories, over a hundred books. Uh, he wrote many TV shows, TV episodes. He wrote uh, screenplays. He was he was a, a man about time. He was best friends with Robin Williams. He only died two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, he was he was very litigious, very angry. Don't ever call him a science fiction writer because he would punch you in the mouth. Harlan Ellison. He was I... very short too. He was like five foot three. Oh well, that's still not short enough for me. <laughs> it's short. It's short for an angry little man. <laughs> I feel like short people are more angry than tall people. One of my favorite mystery science theater jokes is there's a movie where they're watching. Uh, they're watching and there's like a jail house. Like the camera pans across like a police station and you see a guy in cuffs uh, and he looks kind of like Harlan Ellison. And Joel goes, "Hey, they arrested Harlan Ellison." And Crow just goes, "Good." And it's one of my favorite mystery science theater gags. Um, Harlan Ellison, very famous writer. He wrote, Repent, Harlequin, said the TikTok man. Uh, <laughs> he successfully sued James Cameron over the movie Terminator for having stolen two of his stories uh, to turn into the Terminator, even though it's questionable whether James Cameron intentionally did that. Harlan Ellison. Uh, and then he wrote The Whimper of Whipped Dogs, which made me physically angry as I read it. And do you know what? Do you want to know a secret? Yeah. I have actually read this before and I did not know it. Oh, yeah, you told me that when you were at my mom's. Because it was my like, birthday. It was your birthday. It was just your birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. How old are you? 19. How old are you? Ni 19. <laughs> Mitzi declared 19 her favorite number after she found out you were 19. Well, I declare she's nine. Yes. I declare nine my favorite number then. Oh. In Vietnam, he was 19. No, 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 19. You did this, you, I think you did the same joke in the last episode. I love it. Paul Hardcastle, 19. Um, and also reference to the Stephen King's Dark Tower series, 19. Um, if you were a Dark Tower fan. If you're not, that's fine. You don't have to be. Uh, but Harlan Ellison, The Whimper of Whipped Dogs. This is not the first time he used the title, The Whimper of Whipped Dogs. Uh, he used it in an episode of The Young Lawyers that he wrote. Mm -hmm. But they didn't put the title on screen, and he hated what they did with his script. So he was like, I'm going to use this again. So he used it again for this story. The Whimper of Whipped Dogs. You did not like this mo this book. No. Uh, this story. This story. We've said that a million times. Uh, if you could get specific for the benefit of our listeners as to what it was about this story that just rubbed you the wrong way. Men. Men, oh man, what? Men. What did the men do? Gross. Are they gross men? Yes. 
but not Grossman, like the last name, but literal gross men. Mm-hmm. Um, and and weird protagonist, uh, a very pessimistic story, mm-hmm. uh, very graphic, uh, very dark for no reason um, other than it's uh, in 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 slightly misinformed. So <laughs> we have gone around and around and around and around and upside down. And as the opening narration told us, it's the story of, of a woman named Beth who witnesses a murder in New York City along with 26 witnesses and does nothing to stop it. But what is this actual story about, Willow? Men. <laughs> but in what way? In what way? Like, what happens? Like A woman like... who is afraid of violent men mm-hmm. who gets in some very bad situations with these men. Yes. But then what happens to her? She gets attacked. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, I'm trying. I've tried not to dwell too much on yeah. it. Yeah, uh, but what happens at the very end as she is being attacked on her balcony? Do, 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 do. She calls out to some sort of dark god mm-hmm. who saves her by lifting the lifting the assailant up into the air and eating him. Yeah, tearing him to pieces in front of her, and then she becomes one with the city. She becomes another angry, angry member of the of the city. Yeah. And do you want to know why this story made me so upset? Why? Besides the fact that it's, even though it's supposed to be almost a critique or a, not even, not a satire, a, uh, it's like a, I don't know, it's supposed to be metaphoric. I'm not sure what Harlan Ellison thought he was going for in this. The reason it upset me, beyond the graphic depictions of rape and, and forced sex and the weird attitude towards abusive relationships that it has, like... Mm how she capitulates to stuff and it's shown to be like almost a positive quality in her. It's because the story is based on the murder of Kitty Genovese. And what can you tell me about Kitty Genovese? Why would I be able to tell you anything about that? I'm actually happy that you can't tell me anything about Kitty Genovese because her name used to be synonymous in popular culture with something called the bystander effect. Mm-hmm. You, are you familiar with oh, that? Oh, Yeah. Which is which is what? It's basically where uh, people can be watching something horrific happen, but they assume that someone else is going to do something, so they don't do anything. Right. Uh, so for people who aren't familiar with Kitty Genovese, in 1964, Kitty Genovese was murdered in New York, uh, in Queens, in the neighborhood of Kew Gardens, uh, in, in right outside of her apartment building. She screamed for help and a bunch of people went to their windows was the middle of the night and then how the story originally went was they did nothing she escaped from her attacker who then found her again uh stabbed her some more she called for help no one came people just watched it happen she managed to get away again or the attacker left came back again raped her finished stabbing her and then she died all alone uh in front of 38 witnesses who stood there and did nothing the you know the new york times reported on it uh she became synonymous with the with the uh callousness and uncaring people of new york city the the attitude that it this story portrayed sort of stuck with New York for the rest of its existence <laughs> up until basically 9/11 when people started reconsidering New York as like a as like a place uh, and it and it fed into the the understanding of the bystander effect which is the more people who like as you said are there for something happening the, the less there's a chance that people actually do anything and that's all we knew of Kitty Genovese for, for decades. It was that she was the woman who was murdered and nobody did anything. And it wasn't until the 2000s, I think 2008, the New York Times went back uh, and re-examined their story and re-interviewed a lot of people. And then in 2015, there was a movie called The Witness where Kenny Genovese's little brother, uh, Bill Genovese, went and found several of the witnesses and did his own investigation because the story of Kitty Genovese essentially ruined his family and ruined his life in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. Uh, he never got to know his older sister. He they only they wouldn't talk about her because she became this national like thing. She was defined by her murder and he actually went and did an investigation to see who she was and come to find out she was a bar manager. She was a go-between for bookies and uh, gamblers. She was an out and proud lesbian who lived with her partner. She was a loving sister and a loving daughter and a major presence in her community. And she didn't die alone. She died in the arms of one of her best friends who, who ran to her aid. People did call the police. There weren't 38 witnesses. There were only a few people who ever saw anything, and they, many of them thought it was simply a lover's quarrel. Her murder happened outside of the range of people's 
you. It was a completely misrepresented story for decades, and it colored our perception of the bystander effect. And I, the reason I get very angry at this story is because Harlan Ellison uses this faux outrage, which, of course, at the time the story was written, which was 1974. At the time, it was still assumed to be true, but still, he used it as a way of just sort of saying, you see, you see? Cities are bad. People are mostly bad, and we all succumb to the darkness in our hearts. If we're, if we, and if we're going to survive, we've got to succumb to the darkness in our hearts. Life is a nightmare, and and he turns Kitty Genovese, he turns her story even further into a symbol, and he turns her more into just this sort of sort of abstract victim, and that upsets me. That <laughs> angers me because. I fundamentally disagree with 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 the point he's making, with the 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 writing and the story, with him and him using it as a, just a cheap way of like being like there really is a devil monster, and you have to give yourself over to the devil monster to survive in this horrible world. And I don't know. That's my rant on the whimper of whipped dogs. I don't like it. Why don't you like it? Because I don't like how it portrays women. Yeah, what uh, can you expand on that for us? It, the main character, mm-hmm. she's just so passive, and she just feels very much like a blank slate, and she just—I don't want to say she lets things happen to her because she doesn't. She's a victim. Mm-hmm. Um, I just—I feel like her. It's—I guess it's the relationship thing. It just yeah. really bothers me. So there's this guy who who also witnesses the killing and they like make eye contact and he's like a, he like works for like a religious organization mm-hmm. something and, like that and they meet on the elevator and there's a weird moment where he stops the elevator and he's really aggressive towards her and he asks her out and she's like I should be afraid but she's also kind of attracted to him but then at the end of the scene she's like why did I stop this elevator and you're like, wait, what happened? Like, it's a kind of a weird. It's it's probably one of the few moments in the story I actually liked because it was weird and like, wait, whose perception is correct? But yeah, she gets involved with this guy and he's immediately abusive and emotionally manipulative, and then he becomes sexually aggressive and abusive. And yeah, she's sort of shown as just kind of like, like you said, she's not. She's not a. She's not a, an active participant in her in her own victimization. Mm-hmm. But the story wants you to like shake your head and tut tut at her being such a wallflower or mm-hmm. so like weak or something. At least that's the way I read it. Yeah, it has that. It's very it. It paints these things as a bad thing, but the tone of the story makes it seem like it's all her fault. Yeah, like she, because she's trying not to be a bad person. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to become, she doesn't want to become a passive bystander like she witnesses in the beginning or like she was in the beginning. And so she tries to be a good person and and the city keeps like beating her up at every turn, Mm -hmm. like bad, just little slights against her keep happening until she starts fighting, quote unquote, fighting back by like sleeping around with a bunch of men and yelling at homeless people and like just becoming an angry New Yorker like she was trying not to be. It's just not good. It's just not good. It's just not like Harlan Ellison is an intelligent writer Mm -hmm. and he's written some great stuff, some dark stuff, like some some wonderful like I have no mouth and I must scream. I will go to the mat as it's one of my it's one of my favorite horror science fiction stories. It's it's a nightmare story. I read it and I was shook when I read it. It was just it's such a bleak bleak tale of the end of the world. But uh but it's good. Like I understand its point. It's got its problems. It's still Harlan Ellison still wrote things in this era from the perspective of a man Who's just quote unquote, like he just seems to be like ugh just tired of all these mouthy dames like you you get the feeling that he doesn't hold women in very high regard mm-hmm. uh, so in this story writing a woman as a main character who's being kicked around by life and like the victim of sexual violence he doesn't come across as very sympathetic towards her I don't know I mean I feel some there's something about the way he's writing about it makes mm-hmm. me feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. Like I've read I've read stories of like fictional stories that have sexual assault in them that are written by men before and none of them left like well most of them didn't leave me with this feeling of I don't trust this man. 
this man who wrote this. I don't know. It just there's just too much. It's some there's something about it. He tries to be like almost clinically detached from it mm -hmm. when he's describing it. And uh, I read one account, like one one uh, like analysis of the story uh, that mentions that he's trying to kind of try to write in the in the tone of in cold blood which was like one of the first true crime novels mm -hmm. and so kind of trying to maintain that like just sort of sense of like reportage as opposed to narrative but it does it comes across as flippant or yeah get a load of this as opposed to cold and dis like i don't know like maybe there's just too much harlan ellison in the narrative it so comes across just... as very much like i don't know the guy when when did he live <laughs> Is he still Carl alive? Ellison? He died two years ago. Okay. Well, he's dead, so whatever. In his uh, 80s. So he was old. When when did he... When was he a big writer? Um, I would say he was mostly... He was at his peak, like, 19... Uh, like, 50... No, nah, like, late 50s uh, through, like, the late 70s, early 80s was, like, when people were really talking. But he was still writing, like, up until his death. Like, and he was still yeah. collaborating with people. It's just... Men from that era mm -hmm. uh, did things that may at that time not have seemed like a big deal, mm -hmm. but now definitely do. Yeah. This story has, you said it was flippant and stuff and trying to be cold. It it seemed like it was trying too hard to be cold and detached. Mm -hmm. Like there was something he didn't want to write about or he was too, it just felt... It almost glorified it in a sense, I guess I should try to say. I get what you're saying. Like, there's this, if he had actually tried to be lurid about it, it probably would have come across as less offensive to my sensibilities than mm -hmm. him trying to be, like, cool about it. Yeah. Like, if he had tried to, like, make you be like, yeah, I think it would have actually been more tasteful. I think that there's just something, like, there's something about trying so hard to be detached and away from an experience Mm -hmm. that especially one like that it's like he's trying so hard to make it seem like he hasn't experienced something like that right and he I mean, of course who knows if if he ever did experience anything like that mm -hmm. uh or if he was yeah just writing from like i'm a i'm a famous writer i'm a good writer i can write about anything mm -hmm. uh i often go into my like rant about 1960s science fiction writers who were always these like sort of like grizzled white men who ruled sci-fi even though there were plenty of like women and minorities writing they did not get their stuff slapped on the cover of like time magazine mm -hmm. these grizzled white men who like in the in the 2000s all are revealed to have been deeply problematic humans um but also who sort of like envisioned this future this perfect future this utopian future that was always just a utopian future for grizzled white men mm -hmm. like no it's going to be like sexually free man which always meant like i'll get to sleep with anybody <laughs> or like everyone will have equal rights man which basically means like I'll listen to women sometimes. Like, it's always this kind of, like, very qualified, very white male-focused future. And so I think, like, Harlan Ellison was probably just like, yeah, of course I can write about violence to women. Who else is going to do it? I think that this story would have been really good if it had been written by a woman. You think so? I think that, well, at least part of it, the the um the act of a woman reaching out for a to a dark god to help her escape from sexual assault is a theme that I think is really prevalent in women's uh, horror slash sci-fi. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of times we end up feeling powerless. Yeah. And reaching out and gaining the power to do something about it is something that a lot of people write about. Yeah. I think that having it written by a man is really weird. <laughs> Well, also since her like end isn't seen as her getting power, it's shown as like basically her giving up, yeah, and like capitulating to this dark god she's been trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of reminds me of your reaction to the end of the witch. The witch. The movie, the witch. Is that the? Is that one we watched for the podcast, or is that the new one? The new one, the one about the girl living with her family by the edge of the woods, and right. at the end she joins the she joins the coven just not good i hated that movie i know you did but it has a similar ending which is 
she's just giving herself over to another mm -hmm. power that's in control of her. Like she's not, at least that's how I remember you talking about it with me, yeah. which was that yeah. you were just like, she just, she just joins this coven at the end and like, they're just as much in control of her body as her family was. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I felt about the end of this one. Yeah. Especially is, since she ends up with Ray again. Right. You said Ray and I thought Star Wars and I got very confused. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 that better story. Um, yeah. It just, it, yeah. it feels, it's just not, it seems like I get the whole like, oh, I don't want the story to have a happy ending thing because I'm edgy and dark and brooding. Right. But it's just women get bad endings all the time in real life. Yeah. And I don't want to read about that. Right. Yeah. It seems to be like she's safe now because she's now just as terrible as her abuser. Mm -hmm. Like she she just reveled in the death of a person. Now they're on even ground. But just they're like not. The rest, just like the rest of the city, man. But they're not. Because she's not reveling in the death of an innocent person who, right, who just was killed for no good reason. She's she she's reveling in the death of a man who was either who was going to kill, who rape and kill her. Right. Like there's a and, difference. Yeah, and there's also weird racial stuff involved. Because yeah. Yeah. Even though like they don't really go out of your way to say like what race she is, there's a presumption that she's a white woman mm -hmm. and that Ray is a white guy. And then in the end, her assailant is black, oh. like very. Like they mention it so many times. Yeah. I was like, I had to go back and be like, wait, what's happening? This is to me one of the my other, my big problems with it, which is that Harlan Ellison is appealing to Middle America's fear of the city, mm -hmm. which usually means Middle America's fear of black people. Yeah. Like it doesn't mean I'm afraid of these buildings. It means I know that in these alleys are people of color and I am terrified of those. And that Harlan Ellison's using that as like, yeah, see, and they break into your apartment night and they try to kill you and rape you. And, and the only way you can fight back is by being a powerful white woman who embraces her dark God. And I'm like, I don't aren't, know if that's what. Aren't uh, white women mostly attacked by other white men? most sexual violence is is acquaintance violence yeah. yes it's like like you are it's more like what happens with ray it's mm -hmm. it's it's she's she would more likely be attacked by that guy not by some rando breaking into her apartment on like the 15th floor and like and then seeing her and being like i'm gonna change my mo like it's it's weird now granted that did happen to Kitty, Gen Kitty Genovese in real life. She was attacked by uh, a random assailant mm -hmm. um, who, who picked her out for no other reason than as he said, once he was arrested, he wanted to kill a woman. Uh, uh, but he is of course the standout. Like that is, that is not common, which is why stories get written about it. Like, are, that's we, not a are we sure that's the only, that he randomly picked her? Fairly certain. The guy was, uh, there were several interviews with him before his death. He died um, not terribly long ago, like within the last 10 years. Uh, like after, I think after, af no, yeah, because it was after the movie The Witness came out, which was 2015. So yeah, it was only in the last few years. He died and uh, he's a he's a compulsive liar also. Mm -hmm. Like you have, you really, uh, you really <laughs> know. He, he told he told his family that he killed Kitty. Uh, he didn't kill Kitty Genevieve, or he kept changing his story. Eventually, it was like I was just a dr getaway driver for the killer. But then, like he also told his family that like Kitty Genevieve worked for the Genevieve crime family, and that he was afraid for his life, and that like it was it was he was just this compulsive lie. Like, but uh, people who talked to him, like the judges, the 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 uh, the the, uh, the lawyers, uh, people in the justice system, were always just like this guy was not a good like he was he was a, a sociopath he was he had already killed one person he tr he escaped from jail at one point raped a woman was gonna try to like it was just like this guy had problems so again an outlier like he's an outlier yeah <laughs> he's not the he's not what you're in danger from 99.999 percent of the time it's like the whole stranger danger situation yes you had a whole episode about that i did have a whole two whole episodes yeah on the bear show yeah like you're more in danger from people you know yeah like people spread this narrative that strangers are going to be the one to attack and hurt you and i'm not ex like, a, like i'm not like saying like that's never going to happen because it might mm -hmm. but you're so much more likely to be killed or hurt by someone you know yes because most yeah, motivation definitely. comes from interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. yeah uh like a stranger might rob you right but unless they're like really serious about this robbery they're not going to kill you they don't have a reason to 
Right. Right. Yeah, if you if you if you interrupt someone in the process of breaking into your home, the the most common reaction that person's going to have is to run. Yeah. Is to leave. Uh not ramp up the the crime. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know it happens. Yes, everything has a chance of happening, but we're talking law of averages here. And we're talking a man who is trying to build on an already existing fear that people have in order to make a point that's not necessarily true. Mm-hmm. Um, my friend Emma wrote, she's a, she teaches psychology and she's just uh, at, a, at a college. She's a professor. And uh, I posted about the Kenny Genovese murder and she wrote that uh, they teach the example of Kitty Genovese in Intro to Psych. Um, and it's in psych textbooks, like, we know the Kitty Genovese case is more complicated than this, but still bystander effect. And she's like, but the bystander effect is kind of true. Like, there is there is evidence to the bystander effect. Um, so it's not something that's completely been discounted. But the shame of it is, is that we use the Kitty Genovese story to build fear in people. Mm-hmm. Of for something that's not necessarily something that they have to always be afraid of. And then an author like Harlan Ellison comes along almost 10 years later and just reopens that wound and continues to promulgate this myth. And don't think that Kitty Genevieve's story hasn't been used every few years and as an episode of a show or the basis of a movie or another crime book. And it's always mentioned, Kitty Genevieve's, when in fact, again, she was only seen by a few people. Most people thought it was a domestic argument. People did call the police, and one of her best friends actually went down and was there with her as she was dying. It's a tragic story, but it's not the story of the deadliness of a city. It's a it's a one off. It's a it's more an indicative of how people are actually very caring and mm-hmm. will attempt to go out and help people and will hold you as you are in pain. Like that's the story of Kitty Genovese. And I, I got additionally emotional about it because Sophia Farrar, who was the woman who held Kitty as she died, uh, died herself just two weeks ago at the age of 92. And in the, and in the movie, the witness, you know, she didn't want to be in the movie. And then she finally said, okay, I'll do it. Cause she wanted to talk about it. And she said, I only hope that she knew it was me, that she wasn't alone. And I think that that's, if you take anything away from that story and you're going to write a horror story about it, it would be so much better if the if at the end you realize that, no, actually, you aren't alone. The city isn't this evil demon, that there is a community there, that there are people who are more, who are better people than uh, Ray, <laughs> Who will actually like have your back? I don't know. Like, I just it's such a pessimistic story, which I, I'm not discounting yeah. the fact that violence does happen against women. Like, that is not what I'm saying. Yeah, I hate this story. Yes, I am not one to indulge in pessimistic media in the most for the most part. Anyways, like I actively avoid mainstream TV shows because there's so much drama and death. Yeah, and I just like I can't. There's too much going on in IRL. I do, however, think New York is a demon. Uh, my least favorite place that I've ever visited. No offense, mm-hmm. New Yorkers. <laughs> uh, I hate the city. I'm sure there's some. Do. I'm sure there's some wonderful. I know there's some wonderful people there. They have but some you great. You just museums. don't like more than like four people to be in your range of vision at one time, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say something else. I just I hate how women are portrayed in this story. I also yeah the bystander effect. I feel like has. Like, the more people there are, I feel like the less likely it is that someone's just not going to call the police. Yeah. Because I feel like when there's a ton of people around, you automatically assume that the bystander... Like, the bystander effect is so ingrained in people today that mm. you're like, I got to remember to not let that happen. So right. I'm going to follow... going to make sure to call the police. Right. Like, I, that's how I feel anyways. But then, yeah. like, it's just... Why did they have to write the story? <laughs> why was this necessary? <laughs> yeah, and then it went on to win... Uh... It went on to win the Edgar Award in 1974 from the Mystery Writers of America. Uh, And it says it remains his quintessential work of horror. And I absolutely disagree. This is absolutely disagree. Like what happens in the story is horrific. Uh Uh-huh. But it's just, I I just don't think it's good. Yeah. And it gets goofy at the end. Like, I'm sorry, but like the monster God lifting the man up and tearing him apart. It's shocking, but I'm also like, what are we doing? Like all of a sudden your metaphor has become physical and that's not scary. That's just like, I, I didn't like, know how to end this story. Yeah. I think that had she killed the man herself, it would be different. I still think right. it would be a bad story, but it wouldn't at least yeah. be like, and then a demon monster came out of the sky and grabbed the evil man. 
And at first I was like, oh, is it going to be like, you're not supposed to know if this was a demon monster? Like maybe she did kill the guy, but like, she's just, this is how she's, but no, like he gets torn to pieces and then his body parts get like tossed down onto the ground below. And I'm like, I guess, I guess he was torn apart by a monster in the sky. Like, I guess there's no other, there's no other way to, to get around that. There was a monster in the sky. Yeah. I just hate it. I will say I have no mouth and I'm a many Har- I have a Harlan Ellison collection many Harlan Ellison stories yes he's dark and pessimistic but he's also a very forward thinking writer in a lot of ways Th- that's why that's why this one stands out to me uh it's just like what are you doing dude like chill out I mean everyone gets their bad stories especially if you wrote over a thousand of them like I just I don't I wish this one wasn't apparently held up so much yeah everyone gets their bad stories most people's bad stories don't win awards and <laughs> get right. claimed to be the masterpiece of someone's collection hey his fifth wife really liked him a lot i just don't think he likes women that much he was best friends with robin williams robin williams what does that mean aladdin's genie i just don't think carlin ellison liked wi- women that much <laughs> uh robin williams dressed as a woman in mrs doubtfire so he of course he loved women anyone can dress as a woman it's not that hard <laughs> especially with how gendered clothes are no kidding. Just go into the go into Target, buy yourself a buy yourself a I don't know a Five Nights at Freddy's shirt. I don't know what they sell at Target anymore. I never go. <laughs> they still have do they still have a Five Nights at Freddy's section? <laughs> or no, it's all Fortnite now. Sorry. Uh, the Whimper Whip Dog. So two big thumbs up. <laughs> big yeah, fans. definitely. Love you, Harlan Ellison. Uh, if you want to read good Harlan Ellison, read uh, read I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream or anything else, and watch The Witness. It's on Amazon Prime uh, with commercials. It's totally worth watching. It tore my tore me apart. It's a beautiful movie though about an amazing woman and her family. Um, and Willow, what is our next story on the Dark Descent? Young Goodman Brown. He's young, he's good, he's brown. He's none of those things. I Nathaniel think he's Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne. We all know Nathaniel Hawthorne. We do. Writer of, writer of fictions, yes. Young Goodman Brown is going to be fun because it's like the basis of many later stories. Like you'll, There's like seeds of it that like a lot of horror writers use to like sort of create their own stories. So it's interesting. It's kind of like an ur text. As long um, as this isn't like a usual witch story, which is either... It completely sexualizes the Salem witch trials or turns women into evil demon beings. I guarantee you that Nathaniel Hawthorne will not completely sexualize anything. All right. <laughs> he didn't like that. Was he asexual? Uh, he is a sexual beast. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know enough about it. Nathaniel Hawthorne. He died at the ripe old age. If you look at this photo of Nathaniel Hawthorne in the, uh, in the Wikipedia page, you're like, he looks good for 80. Then you realize he died when he was 59. Oh, well. Life was pretty rough. Pretty rough on old Nat, 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 Nat ha- Natty Hawk. Did he have Nat kids? Ha- um, he had three. Una, Julian, and May. Mary. Una, Julian, and Mary. He was married to Sophia Peabody. Why are we talking about Nathaniel Hawthorne? We have next episode to talk about Natty, Natty the H. All right. Natty, hey. Well, that's Natty. the end of the episode. See you later, guys. I'm going to call him Nathaniel Hot Boy. Great. Bye. Please, I'm please don't turn off. Please don't turn off your recorder. <laughs> please don't do it. Uh, so yes, join us next time next week for Young Good Man Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne, and we'll just find out how good that brown is. That I did not mean to say. Stop that. saying stuff like that. <laughs> I didn't mean to say something that was so gross. <laughs> I didn't mean it. This is a children's show. Oh, it's not children. It's a this is definitely show. not a children's show. This is the worst. I'm gonna. I should put an, uh, a warning up top just so people know that like this is a bad episode. Yeah. <laughs> this is actually one of our best episodes. If you agree, listeners, write in and let us know. You know how I know it's one of our best? It's less than an hour long. Yep. All, All right. right, so uh, join us join us for, for, for Natty B, and uh, I'm Phil. And I'm Willow. And we'll see you when it's, it's Del, Del Toro, Toro time. time.